This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook, and have I have a playbook for you. An amazing actress, producer, director, and she's an entrepreneur, that's for sure. I've had a moment to speak with her, the incredible Sarah Wayne Callies. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's so much fun because I normally, because of the virtual world, yeah. I don't really have that much time to talk to people beforehand. Oh, and yeah. a lot of times I don't like to because I don't want to leave it there. Sure. But I'm actually glad that I did because you gave me some great insight on your perspective of the skills, knowledge, and desire that you've gained by your career. And so many people want to uh, be cool. in the entertainment world. It's changed over the world, whether it's an actor, an actress, a yeah, yeah. producer, a director. I'm someone who I you know, have been involved in big sports films, but I knew so little about films when Lee Steinberg asked me to be an executive producer. I had to tell him, hey, I didn't go to USC film school. He said, no, executive producers raise money. Right. You're good at that, Dave. You can do that. Right. Um, for you, at what stage of your life did you decide that you wanted to pr pursue the profession of an entertainer? Uh, you know, honestly, it felt like such an insane economic risk. I planned two other things with my life until about 10 minutes before I graduated from undergrad. And I realized that I would have to fail at acting to be happy uh, settling for anything else. Part of it was, um, it was so collaborative. Like what I do, I can't do alone. You need the technicians, you need the other artists, you need the visionaries. And I like that, I like working in a deeply collaborative environment. And so I thought, well I need a little bit more education, so I went to grad school. Um, and still kind of thought, you know, I'll probably bartend professionally and I'll do a play here and there. Like you just never kind of know what the business has in store for you. But the thing that I learned early on, even in grad school, is you can accommodate, you can, you can compensate for a lot of raw talent through just working harder. And I found that like, I put in more hours than anybody else. And that worked, kinda. And in, in the context of working harder, a lot of people will lean towards working smarter. I talk about working harder, more consistently. Because a yeah. lot of people, I call it the extra mile. They'll work really hard all day Saturday and then use that to justify why they not, they're not where they want to be because right. they go the extra mile every once in a while. Right. What I have found the most successful people like you, it's not just working hard and smart, but it's doing it every single day. Yeah, there's, there's a discipline to it. You know, there's a like, I don't want it today. And it's like, well, so what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> if you, uh, the question I always asked myself, like on every level, in the gym, when I was reading things, when I was gonna keep rehearsing, when I was, was just how badly do you want it? And I think, I think that's a really important question because I was talking to somebody the other day in my business, we've both been doing this for 20 years. And there's, there's a, it's a war of attrition, right? Like I'm at the point where in almost every production that I know, that I go to, I know somebody. Because the people who didn't want it that badly, they left, and by the way, God bless. If you don't want to do it, no shade, it's fine. I don't think it's about punishing yourself putting in 100 hour work weeks, but I think like when I'm going over my lines rehearsing a scene over and over and over and over, I'm doing it because I love it and because I've got this thing in the back of my head that's like, it can get better, it could get better. And I want to tell the story that's better. Nice. It's not just about a grind, it's about a heart. And that falls into the context of collaboration that you have this desire yeah. to tell the story better. But there's also a collaboration that I learned from you know, doing thousands of, of these things, yeah. but also speaking around the world, that a lot of people raise their own awareness by collaborating, I call it source. You can, I don't want to put a religious, spiritual. Sure, sure, sure. But I find that great actresses and actors channel. You it know what? through them. It's crazy that you're bringing this up of all people that I've ever talked to, but um, I was writing something recently, even like Aftershock. I don't feel like I wrote it alone. You know, like I wrote yeah. every episode, I typed all the words. But for me to sit here and be like, oh my God, you guys, I'm so great. I had all these great ideas. Like, I don't, ideas come from somewhere. I don't know where it is. I don't have a name for it. But I think lots of different practices and faiths in the world kind of you know, the smartest, there was this guy, um, 
Sadia, when we were in college, he called it the all. And I always liked that. I like that. I feel like there are times where some part of that, and I bet it's the same in sports, something comes from the all, the, the, the great, the all, the collective, the we're better than the sum of our parts thing. And to me, that's also the core of like, watch your ego. You didn't do this. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. You're, you're not special. You were listening. <laughs> or aware. Or aware. Or cleared interference from the all. Yeah. Or, the, you know, yeah. something bigger than you. Um, both of our careers have evolved. And I, yeah. people ask me to coach them on transition, especially athletes to oh, yeah. the professional world. It's a tough transition. And I say, look, I don't believe in transition anymore. I believe in expansion because expansion Ooh. says, hey, look, I have these skills and this knowledge of who yeah. from all that I did yep. and what, and I still have the desire that I must be what I can be. Yeah. Therefore, it's time for me to expand into TV shows or podcasting or yeah. Is, I mean, I went to law school to be an oil and gas litigator and now I'm sitting- How's that working out for you? Exactly. <laughs> right? I, I grew up with a mom, right? Doctor, lawyer, failure. Yeah. I'm sure someone in your family was like, you're going to be a what? Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know what, honestly, my, my parents were pretty great about it. They just said, understand that economically you're responsible for yourself. So if you can make a living, you can do it. Anybody. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but I always knew that, you know, my That's parents fun. are professors. It's not like someone's gonna my like a teacher, buy me so. a car. Yeah. My mom was a little bit more stringent. She said, you can do whatever you want after graduate school. Um, so that was like Fair. more debt for me to pay. Okay, for yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. I get that. I chose my grad program by the program that gave me a full ride and a stipend. I was like, I can't be in the arts with debt. Yeah, that's yeah. how I uh, chose my college. But I figured if I was going to go to law school, I'll be able to pay for it. Yeah, fair. And uh, fair enough. Now, we well, were talking the, about transition. The Sorry, I didn't mean to. Right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what you do today didn't even exist. And I tell people all the time that we're sitting here, yeah. our five years from now, what we're doing probably doesn't exist. Right. And you want to create things that don't exist. And Aftershock, That's to right. me, is a clear illustration of your imagination, but also your intention. And so- oh, cool, thanks. We, we have to kind of, kind of think about yeah. the future, but it requires that grinder that you are, you yeah. know, that Midwestern girl that you're, you're built with a different ethic, which is to the positive, you know, how much do you see for yourself in the future? We were talking about this great production, audio production, yeah. and Aftershocks in this season two. Yeah. You know, where do you see this going? And do you believe we don't even know where we're gonna be five years from now? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think we know the tech. Yeah. I don't think we know the what or the how, but to me, it always comes back to the story, the story, the story, the story, the story, right? So Aftershock for me was a story I wanted to tell. I was working for Legendary at the time. I took it to them and they're like, we love this. It's way too expensive without IP. And I was Which like, no problem. Which is for like Bill Fay and those guys that say something's too expensive. No <laughs> kidding. Seriously. I was like, wait, but you guys just, I, right. what? Um, but I think somebody at that, at that point, actually in the business, they were like, so guys about these bills, you know? Right, right. You got to um, pay for this stuff. If I'd come to them with like a two person, you know, sitcom that happens at a studio, it might've been different, but I don't think that way, which is unfortunate. <laughs> I think in these huge sprawling stories. And so I thought, well, if we, if we need IP, there's this podcasting space and it's a new space. But that also means that there's a lot more freedom in it for me, right? So if I had sold it to Legendary and we had sold it to HBO, I would have 10 producers looking down my shoulder going, hey, um, you're a first time writer, we've got notes. And by the time you get through those notes, maybe it's better, or maybe the story I wanted to tell got lost. I had two people that were my equal partners that I got notes from on Aftershock, which meant I could really go for it with my vision and their notes were usually like, this isn't making sense. Whatever you were going for, <clears throat> we didn't get there. This second season's coming out August 2nd. I took some really big swings. I don't even know if they're all gonna connect, but that creative uh, license is amazing. And so whether or not the, in five years I'm gonna be telling stories on a podcasting platform, I don't know, but as long as I'm still telling stories, as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm doing what I want to do. So it's about following the. And so path. it's interesting because I am in the same realm of telling stories. Yeah. But there's an important component for me, which is I tie, and it's historical in nature. I 
tie the stories I'm telling to teach a lesson. Yeah. I was wondering, intertwined within the stories, is a purpose for you? Yeah. Are there lessons that you're teaching with the stories, or is there, what is that, for me it's lessons, like I'm a teacher, Yeah. so my stories, whether they're true or not, or amalgamated truth, right. it's to literally teach you a lesson, just like a fresca, you know, they would bring people by a painting to tell yeah. a story and teach a lesson. Yeah, to me, a lot of it starts with visibility. You know, like I grew up in Hawaii and the, the native Hawaiian community is super visible. Yeah. Language, food, dance, music. I had a governor who was Hawaiian. I had teachers. I had police officers, like at every level of my life. I completely took it for granted. I got to the mainland and I was like, where, what? Like it was, <laughs> it was all like last of the Mohicans. I was like, y'all, they're not gone. <laughs> like, there is still indigenous cultures, but people didn't know whose land they were on and they weren't curious. And so a part of, it's not a, not a huge part, because I'm a white girl, but like a part of every story that I'm trying to tell right now is just restoring some visibility. Um, and that in and of itself, hopefully will start to shift. Because like, I can't, I'm, I have no place speaking for any of these communities, yeah. but hopefully I can at least go, Psst, guys, they're here, you should go listen. <laughs> so that's a little bit of my underlying agenda, which is yeah. a gross word, or but purpose, I'll be honest. Or, yeah. yeah, and then in the context of visibility is this idea of awareness, Yeah. and that requires a lot of research. Yeah. And so as you've expanded from just acting in general mm -hmm. to now like developing and writing yeah in a very complex way by the way because uh, <laughs> it, it is yeah um, it's just creating timelines that match and meet season two uh, yeah it, I can't imagine I know I've seen software that at least tries to keep track of you know what people were wearing and how old they were and where they were oh god I would have loved a software program <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is one I'll have to get the name of it but more importantly how hard was it for you to actually have to do the research to make sure that you resonated with people that you wanted people to be visible of? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because um, I, I connected with a bunch of friends in the Hawaiian community and ran some things by folks and whatever. And you, part of innovation, right, is you, try and you fail and you try and you fail and you try and you fail and you try and you succeed and I was trying to mitigate as much failure as I could because I feel a responsibility to you know a community I'm not a part of to represent it uh, represent them in a way that feels respectful I finally connected with um, uh, an elder and an activist in Hawaii over a question I had about something I was doing in season two she actually took me all the way back to the premise of season one and I was like oh I could have done that better. So I actually rewrote like half of the second season so that the character ends up facing the same issue I did, which is I did this with the best mind and the best heart that I could, but it blew it. So the second season actually becomes partly about taking responsibility and offering and uh, asking for forgiveness. And so I think maybe part of it is that your failure becomes a part of your journey. And as long as you can incorporate it and learn from it, it's an instructive part of a journey, not a destructive part of a journey, I hope. And that illustrates another thing, which is detachment. Um, yeah. You know, when you talked about the war of attrition, which I've had even with my podcast, of, look, I'm gonna outlast yeah. everyone. And right. You keep aggregating community yes. that resonates with you. Um, there is, and it's very difficult for hyper competitive people who want to do their best or be their best yeah. to detach from an outcome. And so I was yeah. thinking about the scenario of having to rewrite season two with this character, one character in yeah. mind, that it illustrates to me a maturation I'm served from where you started to like yeah. be able to surrender and work yeah. with time in the context of detachment. I, the, the, my constant struggle is not to take things personally. And in a lot of ways, actually, it was moving into directing on the TV side that really drove that home for me. Because as an actor, I take things personally as a job, right? I've got words on a page, they mean nothing to me, I take them personally, I do my job, I get or paid. Or if you get rejected for a part, 
It's hard not to take it personally. It is hard not to take it personally. <laughs> I've seen it with the actors I represented. Totally. I couldn't do it. No, and it and it, it does. It hurts you, right? Because you're like, I loved this, and it's not coming back at me. But as a director, you literally don't have time to take it personally, and you've got to take the approach of like, best idea wins. You know? Yeah. Deeply collaborative. It's a team sport. I literally say that every day that I'm on set. I was like, guys, this is a team sport. And so th this is a daily battle and a daily practice for me because like I am just somebody who takes things personally and if I'm not careful, gets mad about it and holds a grudge. So I'm constantly going back to myself being like, this is not about you. This is about the story. Um, your ego has no place here. I lose and, that battle some days, but. And do you take that into your personal life? Because I could have you uh, talk to my sister. She lives <laughs> close to Hollywood. Um, are you I, able and capable of taking that in your personal life? I mean, it's it, it's it's a mantra from my husband. Baby, it's not personal. <laughs> it's not personal. It's not personal. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't help when your husband tells you that. <laughs> but it, it, the worst part is that he's fucking right. Right, right. That's <laughs> you know what, what drives I mean? my wife crazy. I know. It's really tough. Um, but also, like, the thing I'm starting to kind of start to understand, even at, like, a, whatever, spiritual level or an ontological level, even when people think it's personal, it's not. Like, even when someone's coming at me. I had someone say to me um, on Facebook once, I'd posted something in support of refugees. Someone's response was, I hope you and your children die in a fire. Nice, yeah. I get some of that nice. You can. We all do, right? Right. And in that moment, it's so important to be like, man, this couldn't be about me. Yeah. This person is going through some stuff. They're trying to work it out on me, but I don't need that. Yeah. And my mantra for that is yeah. hurt people, hurt, hurt people. people. That's exactly right. I just right. have to say, so that's how I respond as well. I say, hey, obviously, you know, we, you have an issue and I'd love to learn more yeah. why this is upsetting you here. Yeah. And I give my personal cell phone yeah. because I want to see if it's just someone that's hurt mm -hmm. or if someone really needs help mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. maybe one or two people out of thousands have ever called me. Wow, that's interesting. And I give my actual cell phone and I think that's it amazing. helps them identify, hey, and some people will apologize as well. There's and, that. And they'll say, I'm Without sorry. the anonymity, people's yeah. people change very quickly. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So as we finish up, you have, you know, season two coming up of Aftershock. Yeah. Season two, August two. August of two, two, <laughs> perfect. And uh, for you, what would you like people to take away from season two? You know, I think, I think we are in a moment where grace and forgiveness are something that we all need. Um, you know, I was doing a panel earlier today. Said what's the most important thing you think people aren't talking about? And I was like, this is not a sexy answer, but civility. Nice. I think we need to be able to talk to each other and be nice and say, I respectfully disagree, not um, And so, you know, look, the, the show, it's, a, it's an, very much an action show and there's a lot of mystery and there's people who die and all of that. But at its heart, I think this is a season about what it takes to say, I need forgiveness. What it takes to say, I offer forgiveness. What it takes to say, I accept it. Because um, if we're Talking honest, my language. we've all got, we've all got a lot of blood on our hands. It's not literal, yeah. but like, we're all a mess, you yeah. know. So, and, and that's kind of a takeaway that I got from season one, was just the premise of, you know, we can be at ease, we can be kind, mm -hmm. we can be at ease. But what are we doing? to interfere with the ease. What are, what are we doing that's creating the dis-ease? Mm -hmm. And at its highest level, yeah. right, we're putting the earth at dis-ease. Yeah. But individually, like you said, we're all a mess. Yeah. And we're all interfering with our potential. You yep. know, this all, which I love, by the way, yeah. the, the oneness. And I think it's really important, especially as a collaborator and coordinator of creativity, because the, the, that's the future storytelling. Yeah. Right? Your content, even this interview, is what the kids are going to like I did watch Mr. Rogers or yeah, Sesame Street. Yeah, yeah. This is what's going to form our mindset, our heart set, and our handset. Yep, and I expand love that. imagination yeah. through great content storytelling mm -hmm. and inherently a purpose, a lesson, a passion, or even in business, a profitability, which yep. is an objective, or one of my objectives of business stuff that I do. 
Um, but thank you so much, Sarah, for joining I, me. Playbooks I love that that's what you got out of the show. <laughs> that means a lot to me. Well, cool. Um, I, I was either thinking she's going to think I have no idea what it's about or she might no, enjoy no, my No, no, I'm all about it. No, thank Very you. I cool. appreciate it. Well, we are blessed to be here at the World's Business Web Tech Show in Toronto Collision. We're with the extraordinary Sarah Wayne Callies. Thank you so much here with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook. <laughs>